The Myers-Briggs tells me where I am. The Enneagram tells me where I am, but also where I need to be in life. This episode was originally released under the podcast titled Teaching and Learning Theory versus Practice. This rebooted episode has been migrated to Teaching and Leading with Dr. Amy and Dr. Joy. I am Dr. Amy Viaclia, Director of Educator Preparation. And I am Dr. Joy Patterson, Chief Diversity Officer. Our podcast addresses issues through the lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion, along with solutions for us to grow as educators. So join us on our journey to become better teachers and leaders. So let's get into it. Hello, Dr. Joy. Hello, Dr. Amy. How are you? I'm doing really well. I'm curious about the profile I have submitted to the guests we're having today. Yes, what are you curious about? I mean, this is not our normal guest, right? This guest can really give us a lot of insight about ourselves and make a healthier joy in Amy. <laughs> Absolutely. He has provided professional development for a number of organizations and districts, and it's all about wellness and about well-being. So let me introduce the Reverend Dr. Daryl Griffin, who is a senior pastor, spiritual director, published author, certified ministry coach, and Enneagram trainer, who is committed to educating, empowering, and transforming the lives of God's people. Since January 2000, Dr. Griffin has served as the senior pastor of the Oakdale Covenant Church of Chicago, Illinois. Under Dr. Griffin's visionary leadership, Oakdale continues to be recognized as a haven of hope and spiritual transformation in the community. His commitment to holistic ministry has manifested itself through the tremendous growth of Oakdale, the expansion of Oakdale Christian Academy and Child Care Center, and the establishment of the Oakdale Community Development Corporation. He has provided professional development to a number of organizations, as we said, and I'm looking for some development myself. Welcome to our podcast, Dr. Griffin. Welcome. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Glad to have you with us. I must say you're not our normal guest. I mean, we have a wide range of guests, educators, authors, students, parents, really wide, broad how we talk about education. I think this is the first time we've had a pastor. So thank you for being here. And, and you are, I mean, you are an educator, right? So. Yes. We're going to get into it and you're going to educate us on a lot today. So I want to get started by, I want to hear more about you. Tell us about yourself. Tell us about your book, Building a Better You, because Amy and I want to build a better joy in Amy, specifically using the Enneagram and correct me if I say it wrong, finding our purpose, healing and success in relationships. I mean, we can use all of that. So spend as much time as you need to spend with us today. <laughs> but tell us more about yourself and this journey that you're on now. All right. Well, I pastor Oakdale Covenant Church. I've been there for the last almost 23 years as the pastor. I served in Brooklyn, New York as a pastor for three years. And then I served on staff at Abyssinian in Harlem under Dr. Butts for seven years. I was born in Wisconsin in Kenosha. I went to Kenosha Public Schools, went to Morehouse in Atlanta, the school of Dr. King. So I graduated from there. And then I went to Harvard for my graduate work, spent three years at Harvard. And then I did my doctoral work at North Park University. And have two sons. So they, when my oldest son is getting ready to graduate from Morehouse and applying to law school. And my youngest is applying to high school, I mean, to college. So he graduates this year. So you are truly, truly blessed. Yes. Yes. 
And I started just a little bit about me and the Enneagram. I started learning about the Enneagram in 2007. And I was just blown away at how it kind of nailed me. And really, I've always studied Myers-Briggs and leading from your strength. So when I got to the Enneagram and it really and truly nailed me, I thought we need to use this at our church. And we also run a school, a Christian academy. And so I thought this could be very helpful in the church and could be very helpful in our school as well. So you just said Myers-Briggs, and so now our listeners are curious. Explain what the Enneagram is and how does it compare to Myers-Briggs? So, for example, you know, Myers-Briggs, I'm actually an ESFP, which means I'm an extrovert. I'm a serving. I have feeling and perceiving. So that's sort of me as it relates to Myers-Briggs, the Enneagram has nine personality types. So it's a little bit different. And so one is actually, we perceive as a good person. That is the oldest child or the one that takes leadership in the family. The perfectionists, they're usually, they're usually the ones that have all the awards, the plaques and the achievements. And then twos are loving people where they put other people's needs before their needs. They've never met a stranger, easily connect with people. Threes are efficient people where they operate in systems. So they are your, they're, they're actually allergic to incompetent and inefficient people. They break out into hives around those people. And, and they're the ones that will create a process. Uh, they can be image conscious. They're the ones who make great coaches because they know how to create systems to bring the best out of people. Fours are original people, where they're your artists, your creatives. Fives are wise people, your introverts, your intellects. Sixes are loyal people. They're your law and order, black or white, never to color gray, military kind of like. Uh, sevens are joyful people. They're your big picture people, a love to travel, risk takers, adventurers. Eights are powerful people. They're your captains of industry, your activists, people who have strong personalities. And then nines are peaceful people where they're your reconcilers and ecumenical people. And so you notice I've just named all nine of them. And sometimes we can flow within some of them, but we're going to have some level of a domination in maybe one or two of those categories, if that makes sense. Yes. And I know later on, you're going to tell us about ourselves. Yes. We took the test. And, and so, but before we get to that, let's go back to Myers-Briggs and I've taken some, some other similar ones and I've taken it. I see it on paper and I say, yes, okay, I can see that. That's me. It fits my MO. It fits my personality. And I can see that. But then beyond that, I don't really do anything else with it. You know, it's on paper. I don't do much with it. Oh, it was a fun activity. But talk about when we learn more about ourselves, right? How do we use this knowledge to find purpose and be more successful in our respective lives? You know, what's the whole point of doing this? Yeah, so great question. What, again, the Enneagram, the the Myers-Briggs tells me where I am. The Enneagram tells me where I am, but also where I need to be in life. So the whole goal of the Enneagram is to help you to create balance. And part of this the, the, the assessment tool of the Enneagram is the more you know about yourself, the better you can be in relationship with other people. And I argue that the people who really give you the most problems in your life are people who don't know their purpose. They don't know their purpose. Think about it. They don't know their business. So therefore, they're always in your business. And so that's why it's very difficult. And what I learned is, is that purpose is offensive. So once I know what I'm called to do, I can no longer be co-opted by other people. And sometimes the fact that I know what I'm supposed to do, I know what I'm called to do, I know what I'm here for can be offensive to other people because they have agendas for my life. 
<laughs> and so now I know this is what I'm called to do. So that's why I find that the Enneagram helps you to get centered. It helps you to find your purpose because you're understanding yourself. Why am I here? When we do in my, in my book on the Enneagram, I ask people to do a, a mission statement for their lives. You know, mission statements, businesses have mission statements. Governor State has mission statements. Your, your podcast has mission, a mission statement, and it helps keep us focused. And we need to be focused. Other than that, we'll wander in the street and get hit by distraction. So we need to have some level of focus. And so a personal mission statement is important to get us focused in life. It's a flight plan. So when I'm hooking up with someone, if I'm going to California and they're going to New York, we instantly know that we're not going in the same direction. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's great to have it. And then it helps you to, it helps you to start getting a, a purpose. It helps you to find healing because now I don't take it personal. I thought that when Dr. Amy is yelling at me, I, I'm taking it personal. And she may yell at everyone. Right. She's a, a yeller. Yes. Yeah, she's a yeller. She's yes. an equal opportunity she's an opportunity yeller. yeller. Yes. <laughs> yes. I tell her right. that all the time. You're an equal That's opportunity right. hater, Amy. <laughs> That's right. And so, you know, it's like, why am I being <laughs> taking it personal when that's not something that you know, she's even, Dr. Amy's not even thinking about that. Dr. Joy's not even thinking about that. And once we, I understand that, then I can move on from that and not take it personal. And I can start to heal from some of the things that have been said to me. So I can see exactly why, number one, in church, I go to church and I'm a PK kid, you know, I'm a PK. And I can see with all the different organizations why this is important, because we can get off track, right? Mm -hmm. And we should be there only for one thing. And it's lots of ways to be off track. So I could see using this for harmony mm -hmm. and to stick to our mission in church. I can also see it on the teacher's lounge. Remember why you <laughs> remember why you do what you do, because there's a lot of things that go on in the teacher's lounge that should not go on the teachers in the teacher's lounge. There's a lot of conversations that shouldn't take place because we get off track. Right what our true mission is. So this is really good stuff. I see a flyer. I see some kind of thing going on my wall right now, just to remind me. Yes. Stay focused. I mean, and the other thing I want people to see is, is that understanding yourself is the hardest thing you'll ever do. It is the hardest thing you will ever do is to understand yourself. And that's because everyone else knows you that your family, my family knows me, I know them, but guess what? I don't always know myself. You know, I, and when I'm, in a, when I'm in the midst of an organization, I can tell you all the problems, all the joys, all of that in the organization. The only thing is, is I can't tell you what I contribute to the team. Sometimes it's my attitude, it's my issues, and I don't even know that that's permeating. I don't even know that my strong personality has offended people. I don't know that my being quiet is offending people. I don't even know that. And so I need tools to help me bring some level of balance to, to, to the organization, to the team I'm on, but also most importantly, that I would understand more about myself so that I can fully show up and contribute to, to the team and contribute to the organization. Is that making sense? Well, yes, but that leads to a question I have. What does the Enneagram mean for the work that you do? Okay, it, so, so the work that I do as a pastor, it helps me explain me to other people, and it helps me to understand my staff and also understand the leaders and as a case of the school, it helps me understand, helps the teachers understand themselves and me understand the teachers and the administrators and all of that. So it gives us, it gives us a common language to be able to understand each other. And what happens is, is it's caused conflict to drop by 90% because I'm not taking it personal anymore. We're not taking it, you should see us now. We start to operate based upon 
if someone has a strong personality, we know they have some eight tendency in there and we're not taking it personal. Before it was, she looked at me and you should have heard what she said to me or what he said to me. And, oh, I was so offended. Well, now you realize that that's not necessarily to be taken personal. Uh-huh. Is that making sense? Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah. Or, or someone is a perfectionist. Why does everything have to be perfect? Well, there are one. They're going to have everything perfect. So what we've got to do is help that one understand that not everybody wants it perfect. Some people just want it done. Uh We want to know why is it that you're so helpful? And every time you want something done, you just ask this person because there are two. They always put other people's needs before their needs. And we've got to learn to ask, help them to say, you've got to have some boundaries. You can't help everyone here. You've got to stay focused. Yes, the people down down the hall need help, but we need you to stay on task here. Uh And now it explains it rather than saying, well, I was just trying to help. You're such a mean organization. You all don't want to help anyone here. No, we want to help people, but we need you to stay on task. And now I, when, when I'm li- li- talking to my twos who are like that, they understand they're social butterflies. They want to come and knock on your door. They want to know, oh, my God, Dr. Joy, how was your weekend? And you're like, OK, well, that's great. But you don't need to do it three times that day. I just, <laughs> it's OK. If people don't understand that the Enneagram and their numbers, they'll think that you're being rude because you've closed your door. And you don't want to answer and you don't want 99 icebreakers for every event. Let's get to the point. You know, I went to a discussion last week, the courage to teach. And one of the speakers talked about teacher educators. You need to get rid of your classroom management courses. You don't need to manage students. You need to build relationships with students. You need to get to know who they are. I think this is an excellent way Mm -hmm. to get to know your students. I can't wait to share this book when I'm finished with it with my mother, because you were talking about her a few minutes ago. You didn't know it, but, (laughs) and she will agree. If you look in the dictionary under perfect, you would see Shirley and she wholeheartedly accepts that. So I can't wait to share this with her, but I think the things that still get under my skin with my mother, you know, no matter how much I love her, It's because I don't define that this is who she is. So every time it happens, it bothers me. Instead of me accepting that this is her profile, this is who she is. And then I have to learn how does my profile then work with her profile, right? So can you share some examples of how using Enneagram has helped people? How have you used it to help people? So for, so for example, I had a parent come up to me after a session and say, you solved a problem between my daughter and I in two hours that we've been in therapy for two years. And I was like, what are you talking? Are you serious? So then I discovered that this person is a one, which means they're a perfectionist. They're also a three, which means they're very processed and organized. And they're an eight, which means they have a very strong personality. That's the mother. The daughter is a two, which means very loving, loves everybody, sees the good in everyone. She's also a four, which means she's creative. She loves to sing and dance. And she's very artistic. And she's a seven, which means she's a risk taker. She's adventurous and all of that. So in all actuality, the daughter is a flower child, <laughs> okay? The, the, daughter is, the daughter is never going to color in her lines. She's never going to be fully organized. The mother was wanting her daughter to be like her. So she was thinking that because the daughter wasn't organizing her life the way she thought it, that her daughter was somehow trying to offend her, trying to be a rebel against her. And really her daughter was just being herself. And what her mother discovered is, is that, wow, I've been spending so much time making my daughter into me instead of allowing her to be herself. That's where the clash comes in. 
Now, here's the thing. Flash forward five years later, I run into them at Target. She remembers me. I don't remember her. And I said, oh, well, how's your daughter doing? She said, our relationship is great. And I said, what was the turning point and everything? She said, when I realized that I, my daughter is never going to be me, and I had to let her be herself, but I did a lot of damage making my daughter into me making her perfect, making her this. And she said, and now I'm trying to help her really understand herself so that she can authentically be what she needs to be. That's a clear example of that. So then that's when I realized when we're dealing with, with teachers is helping teachers understand that, that your students are coming there with these nine arrays of personality. Some of the kids are going to come and they're going to have everything nice and neat. Some are not. It's, and, 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 and of course, as we, we learn as teachers, you learn that every child learns differently and all that. But what we do is we bring this implicit bias to the table that, OK, here's how I process things. This is how they should process things. And in some instances, when you're the teacher, you get to call the shots. But here's a way of being able to say to people, I'm a one, I'm a three, I'm an eight. Here's how I see things in this classroom so that you might pass it, all right? So now the students adjust to that, if that makes sense. I, I absolutely think that we're at a space right now where we need something different, some other way to approach the classroom, to approach our profession. I mean, we are facing incredible levels of stress, anxiety, and overwhelm in all professions. And in our context with Dr. Joy and me both being in teacher education, we are seeing this play out as burnout with educators. So I want to ask, how does knowing your Enneagram and more specifically your purpose, how might that help alleviate this burnout? Is it possible? Well, in, in some instances, it is. Because here's the thing. I realized when I was understanding the Enneagram that I can, I'm a three and a seven. So that means I'm also a risk taker. So I can do multiple things. But what I discovered with the Enneagram, I was getting burned out. And I was discovering with the Enneagram that, listen, I can do anything, but I can't do everything. So... <laughs> I realized that, wait a minute, I'm trying to do 50 things and make it look like I'm doing it right. And I'm not. And I'm getting burned out. And the old saying is what keeps the fire burning is space between the logs. So I knew that I needed some space between the logs. I can't do all of this stuff. And I had to be comfortable with that. But if once I understood that my personality has the proclivity to pick up a lot of different rocks. I have this proclivity to do that. I'll pick up a rock <laughs> because that's what I do. Oh my God, let me help this person. And then I get mad that I've got 39 rocks you know, in my pocket. And I'm like, okay, well, first of all, now I know I've got to have boundaries. Now I know I have to learn to say no. All of that helps me to not be burned out. I learned to take, take time off. I learned to take retreats. I learned to care for myself where, remember, we weren't taught to care for ourselves. When you're a teacher, you're not taught to care for yourself. You're taught to care for the students. You're taught to, you know, education by any means necessary. You know, you're taught to come early and stay late. You're taught all that. And so all the boundaries are gone. So, so students are calling you at nine o'clock at night to tell you what was, what was the next assignment for the next day without reading anything. And so when we start to say, we have boundaries, you can call me between seven o'clock and 7.15 in the morning, I will be in my office or nine to 9.15, but I don't, I don't answer emails after five o'clock unless it's a emergency, emergency, emergency. So by helping teachers set up boundaries, but that's my personality. 
I learned from my personality that I don't always have that skill. Now, guess what? Dr. Joy may have that skill. She may know to say, this is what we're going to do. And she can do that. But unfortunately, I don't have that skill. Neither <laughs> does I'm just saying she might, but I'm just yeah, saying that would be a are, wish. <laughs> those are the people who have that. But I'm just saying the Enneagram gives you the tools that you can start to look at yourself and begin to make those adjustments so that you don't get burned out. So everything that you're saying is true. And I'm in the background laughing because before we came on, we were talking about our 12 hour days. And that's what Amy and I like to do. We like to pick up a lot of rocks. We like to extend ourselves way beyond what the description of our jobs entail. And then you get so people become dependent on it, right? And now you have to respond to everyone. And I definitely can see that as a pastor. And it's the same way as with educators that you keep extending and they expect more and they expect more. And I love that analogy that you use about how do you keep the fire burning? There needs to be space between logs. And when we give our times to be reflective practitioners, right? When we give ourselves time to even think about ourselves, do you even think about what you like, what you want to you, it makes a healthier us. So I am really interested in what you learned about us. I think I had some that were like zeros, which is scary. Oh, yes. So who, who is wants really to go first? Scary. Who, who wants to go first? I want to hear Joyce first. <laughs> okay. All right. So Dr. Joy, your highest numbers are a one and an eight. So that means you are obviously either the oldest child or the baby or the one that takes leadership in the family. So they rely upon you. You are a natural born leader. So you could be in a room of a thousand people and for some reason you will get called on to do something. And you don't know why you always get called on to do something. And there, many of the things that you're doing, and, and, and same way with Dr. Amy, many of the things that you both are doing, you've never even imagined doing it. Just it just, it's like, it's like, it's like it just stumbled onto you. It's like, you know, you don't know how you did it. You didn't pursue it. It just happened. You just happened to mention it. And somebody said, oh, well, let's do this and let's do that. And next thing you know, you're leading a podcast. <laughs> you just, and that happens to you all the time. And you also would like for people to take their share of responsibility so that you don't end up with all the work. So you remind people that like if you're caring for your mother, you remind people that she's your mother too. So if we all work together, we can get through whatever. You are also the darling of the family. So you get the awards, the plaques, and all that. And that sometimes can spark jealousy because you do the right things. And you sometimes can be a long ranger in that because you have things that you say, well, if people can't do it right, then let me do it. And so you'll dive in and you'll do it. I can see that. Yeah. Preach, pastor. Preach. I can see that. You're 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 telling the truth. You're also an eight, which means you have a strong personality. And um, the interesting thing about your personality is that you will never start a fight, but you'll finish one. So, you know, you particularly when people mistake in your niceness for weakness and see, Dr. Joy, you're always telling people we don't have to talk like this. We don't have to go there. You know, we don't have to be just. But once they cross that line, then Dr. Joy is not responsible for what comes out of her mouth because you have taken Dr. Joy there. (laughs) Oh, so funny. Okay, so I am a middle child, but Mm -hmm. I take on all the leadership roles of my siblings. My older sister, she's no longer with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I take on all the leadership roles. My mother depends on me for everything. I plan everything. So I am the go-to person. So you, you really nailed me. And right. on Friday, 
I recently changed positions. Uh, my new position is uh, Chief Diversity Officer for Governor State University. So I'm honored to be in this position. But we were having a little bon voyage party for me on Friday. And mm-hmm. I acknowledge, you know, the faculty that gave me the worst time, the absolute worst time of how I just worked on that because she became my BFF. Mm. Because, you know, in terms of that leadership thing, I tell my grandson, you don't work, you don't eat. And I'm serious about that. Mm -hmm. You don't work, you don't eat. (laughs) And light hands, you know, you get to that many hands make light work. So those are my two things. So even though I do leadership, like you have to be accountable. You have to collaborate, right, right, Amy? We have to collaborate. We have to get the work done. And if you don't like me, you eventually will. <laughs> I, will wear, I will wear on you eventually. Right. Dr. Joy, you have never met a stranger, so you can easily connect with people. You are a process person, so you kind of think things through. You are allergic to incompetent and inefficient people. They do make you break out into hives. You do like your environment harmonious and peaceful. You cannot work in drama. Whatever is presented to you needs to look good, not only only be good, but look good as well. You also, as much as you love to connect with people, you must have a moment where you are alone to process your feelings and thoughts. So you have a cave in your house where both you and Dr. Amy have a cave that you go in and you decompress. And when you, when you both come home, you actually will grunt as you're greeting to whomever is at home, you grunt, and then you go into your cave and you decompress. And once you finish decompressing, then you're ready to talk and engage. If people follow you into the cave, they will be eaten. So, so, cause you need that minute. And sometimes when you come in, even for the, at, at the office, you'll come in and you need your door closed so that you could have a minute to yourself before everything gets started. You can be very loyal, Dr. Joy, loyal to a fault. So there are people that you really need to let go of, but for some reason they have been able to people who are really close to you, they've been able to maintain this relationship because you kind of feel sorry. You're like, oh my God, I really need to be there for them. I really, even though they frustrate the hell out of you, you still continue to be in relationship with them and you don't know how to get out of that relationship. And sometimes you are, you could be committed to uncommitted people. They're not committed to their own development you know, and you're there trying to help people. And sometimes you're just gonna have to say, look, I can't be committed to uncommitted people. Now, here's the last thing, your your four is a zero, which means that's your creativity, Dr. Joy. That's telling me that something's going on in your life right now that you're not in touch with your creativity. You are so busy taking care of everyone else and everyone else's needs that you're not taking care of yourself. So you're, 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 you're getting your creativity from your reserve. So you're actually pulling out stuff that's in the reserve. It's stuff you've done. You say, oh my God, you know what? This is simple. I'll pull this together. Oh, I've, I've seen that before. I'll pull that together, do this. That. And so it's not, it's not fresh. It's recycle things that you've made it look fresh. And what you have to do is take an art class, a dance class, a writing class, something to help you get back in touch with your creativity. Does that make sense? Oh, yes, it makes sense. It makes it makes a lot of sense. It also explains why I have to come in and take a shower before I can kiss my husband. Mm-hmm. You do. Yep. Yep. And you, that you shower do. is my happy place. And I can wash the day away and it bothers him that I walk past him. That's right. That's and I have to disrobe and take a shower and before I can come back and kiss him. 
That's right. That's the grunt. Remember, you you uh -huh. come in and you grunt basically and go in. And so again, now here's the thing: people, your husband would be offended if he didn't know you. But now with the Enneagram, you're able to say, this is how I'm wired. Not that there's something wrong, but this is just how I'm wired. I have to have this, you know? And in some instances, um, people, when, you're a when you have that five in you, people mistaken you as being standoffish or arrogant when you're not. Sometimes when you shut down and being quiet is because you're, you're uncomfortable in the environment. You don't know the people. So you can be talkative around people that you know, but when you go in environments where you don't always know the people and you don't always know where you are, you tend to assess it and then you engage in it. Is that making sense? <laughs> where some people just walk in and start greeting people. You walk in and you kind of look around and observe what's going on and you look for familiar faces. If you don't see any, you wait until you do, and then you slowly approach people. But if you know everybody, then you'll greet people and hug people and all of that. And they're like, oh, Dr. Joy, so glad you're here and all that. And so you love all of that, but when you're, un but, but people will perceive you as being standoffish uh -huh. because you're not very talkative when you first meet someone, if that makes sense. Makes total sense. All right. Now, let me jump to Dr. Amy. Uh oh, Dr. Well. Amy, you yes. are a, your highest number is a six. You are a very, very loyal person. I mean, when I tell you, you are a friend that sticks by people. I mean, real loyal, but you're also a very cautious person and you are a calculated risk taker. So you have to think things through. And sometimes you can overthink it. You can overanalyze it and you can create, because you can overanalyze, you become a paralysis of analysis kind of thing. And you, because you're searching, you're trying to get understand it. And part of what you like to do is kind of, you need rules and order in order to perform. So you're like, okay. And both of you have a five tendency to you, but both of you would prefer it's easy to reach you. It's, it's easier for you to communicate through texting and email than to pick up the phone because, <laughs> because it's easy for that. Because, you, you know, Dr. Amy is, can be an introvert at times. She, you know, she can, she's, she can really live in her head and she can live in her books and in her knowledge and all of that. And so the pandemic really didn't bother her. She loved it. She loved being at home and she loved reading and studying and, and the quiet time and, and all of that. And she did all of the things that the people told. She wiped down the Amazon stuff. She wiped down her groceries. She, you know, she did all of that because she can be a cautious person but a very loyal part. You also may be, I think, Amy, Dr. Amy, you're the oldest child or the one that takes leadership in the family yes. of some sort. Mm -hmm. So you are another one, high achiever, a perfectionist, very reliable, you know, very hardworking. And you also another one that can be a long ranger. So when it's not done right, Amy, Dr. Amy knows how to jump into gear and get it done right. And both of you, are so compatible. It's amazing that I don't usually see people, you all have a similar personality. So that's pretty much why you kind of kind of get along together because both of you can be leaders. Both of you need time alone to process your feelings and thoughts. Both of you can be very loyal. The only thing is, is Dr. Amy is a little peaceful. She does not like a lot of confrontation. She really doesn't like that. Where Dr. Joy doesn't, she doesn't like confrontation, but she doesn't, she don't run from it. And so it takes a lot for Dr. Amy to really confront it. So, because, and, and a lot of times people have mistaken your niceness for weakness. And that is not the case. You are a very, a very strong person, very capable person, and very capable of defending yourself. 
but you like to defend yourself with words. So you like, if, 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 if somebody comes at you, you like to write a long letter or email to let them know just how you feel and all of that. <laughs> and, and that's helping you get it off your chest. So, and then both of you, because you are professors and all of that, one of the things that you know you're dealing with the five, like both of you, is you give out great instructions. So, because you think through things. And so what really irks you is when students or faculty come up to you and they say, Dr. Amy, Dr. Joy, what about such and such and such and such? And you said, did you read the email? And so what you would do is write them back. And this is how you know you've pissed off a five is you'll write stuff like per the email that I sent on October the 12th in line in the, in the fourth paragraph of the email, I outlined all of the information that was needed for this assignment. What I would like for you to do is the next time, please read the email carefully. And if you have some additional questions, let me know after you have thoroughly read the email. Sincerely yours, Dr. Joy and Dr. Amy. That's how you, that's when you know you get pissed off. I just want our listeners to know that Dr. Amy and I are on silent because we're in the background. We're howling in the background. Um, right. um, but, is it, but, but am I telling the truth? Uh-huh. It, and, and you can tell when you haven't quite ticked us off is if we repeat what we need to say in the email and this nice long very right. now we're going to put bullets and make it very a whole lot clearer that's right but then if it's like really they didn't get it the second time okay per the email that we sent right. that's right you're going to do it and they're, they're going to know it and then the other thing for you dr amy is you are very creative so what that is, uh, I don't know what you sing, do you dance, do you write, do you act? She but you're sings. Very, she yeah. Does. So, so it comes off. In fact, you're pretty, pretty ba a balanced leader. So you don't get a lot of, a lot of things don't really stress you out as much because Dr. Amy knows how to really disengage. So she knows how to kind of go into her world to read or to sing or to whatever, you know how to do that. Um, and that has become an escape for you to help you with a lot of your stress is that because too many people, too much, you know, too many uh, large events and all that can be draining to you, you know? So you mm -hmm. go to events because you have to, not because you want to. So, you know, you would prefer, you would go if, you know, but it's like, you know what, you have no problem in being by yourself and enjoying yourself. I will be at a large party and have a conversation with one person the entire night. That's right. I mean, it's, it's, it has happened. And yeah. if I have obligated to go somewhere, I will do it but I am just as likely to send my regrets. Like I don't like to be in different spaces that I don't know people. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And the other thing that both of you have this gift is the gift of discernment. So you both can feel something is about to happen. You can feel it before it happens. And you don't know where that comes from, but you just feel it. And a lot of times you can, you can sense someone, you could just feel it. You say, something's not right. I don't know what it is, but something is not right. You can even get that intuition to go home. And you're like, okay, I don't know why I need to go home. But every time you don't, you ignore it, you always regret it. And because you're fives, you sometimes can overanalyze it and say, well, that seems like a good person. I mean, you know, we, you know, we do have similar whatever, but every warning sign is coming to you and you're ignoring it. And then when something happens, you say, you know what? Something told me 
to stay away from that person, not to go into partnership with them. And I didn't listen. And, you know, you kind of regret that, but you have that great discernment. I say, lean into that because that has literally saved you a lot of stress and anxiety. So see, Dr. Amy, when you sit there and you say, when you're looking at that invitation and this, and you're saying, you know what, not this one. And when you go, you you'll turn around and you say, you know what, something told me not to come. <laughs> and you know, it's just like, oh, oh, I could have, I could have skipped this one. And you you knew that. You knew that. And then sometimes you'll get an invitation and something will say to you, Amy, you need to be at this. Mm -hmm. And then you'll say, you know what? Yes. And then you'll get there and you say, I am so glad that I came. All right. Yeah. That's, you you I, nailed it. I could, I could go on and on. You ladies. really, you really <laughs> nailed it. And a lot of things we've had to figure out about ourselves and how we best work together. And there has been a lot of give and take for us to work harmonious together. So you you really, really nailed it. A lot of it was funny because you, you, you saw that truth in us, you know, and it was funny to hear it, but also it was very emotional to hear those things too. And I was going to ask you questions about, you know, Dr. Amy was talking about teachers and administrators facing burnout and how does this method of using the Enneagram help to build a better, healthier teacher and even a student that has anxiety? But we get it. You explained it very, very, very well. So I do want you to spend a few minutes because there's, I mean, just everything that you said, knowing yourself, how you interact with others and beyond knowing yourself, knowing that that other person has the same thing going on. You know, they, it, it's their personal self, right? And being able to take that into account that it's not just you. And how do you best work with that person on the similarities and the differences? Because sometimes the similarities, because Amy and I are both strong leaders. Sometimes that can be the challenge that you have two strong leaders and knowing when to let the other person take the lead. And that's one of the things Amy and I have worked on. And I think we've accomplished that when to let the other person take the lead because we know a little bit about each other's strengths. So it's very emotional to me to, to learn all of this, to learn more about myself. And then for me is how do I share that? You know, the first person that I want to share with, and he'll be reading the book too, is my husband. Because I think anyone that either you work closely with or you have a relationship with, you both need to understand who you are. And which is why I think it's so powerful in the classroom. If you're going to spend a whole year in a classroom with these students, then really get to know each other. And then that's how we get away from managing kids to really knowing kids and having a relationship with them and knowing why they have some of the quirks that they have, right? Or some of the things that may drive us crazy. But I want you to talk. So I want you to, to give you this last time to really talk about the book and what your hope is that this book will bring to bring to people. So in the book, I help you talk about the Enneagram. It's not an extensive piece on the Enneagram. The book is about the Enneagram, but the, you know, it's so much that you could talk about. But my purpose point of the book is to get you to your purpose. And also to help people, there's a section that I have in the book on how to handle staph infections. You know, staph infections don't just occur in the hospital. <laughs> you know, you have a staph infection at work. And then I, I talk about that. I talk about how do you deal with these people that really are irritating you and, you know, really making you feel uncomfortable. And part of that is helping you to know yourself so that at some point you have to address it. You know, you have to get the courage from within to address it instead of letting the people just walk all over you. The other thing is I talk about how to handle cave people. Cave people are citizens against virtually everything. So when you're dealing with people who are against every single thing 
and you've had that with faculty. You go, you go left, they want to go right. There's nothing, mean, and you say, well, what do you want? Well, I don't want that. And so it's just, it's just how do you handle those things? And the Enneagram becomes the tool to help you deal with some of that. So I often say part of what I'm trying to do is to help you understand yourself and understand how do you manage difficult people. How do you have the tools to be able to handle all of these different personalities? Because sometimes it feels like we're, we're leading a daycare center versus an organization because everybody's whining and crying about something. But I, 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 I want people to realize that Maya Angelou said, long after people forget what you said to them, they always remember how you made them feel. And so part of this thing is, is helping you to become aware. Is Dr. Joy and Dr. Amy, are they going to completely change as a result of this? No. But I hope that they have some sense of awareness. So now you become aware of some things because the more you know, the more you grow. And I want to know from people in reading this, when you're building a better you, remember, you can't do this overnight. It takes time to build a better you. It takes time to understand your purpose. It takes time for you to find, to get healing and success in relationships. But this is the first journey, first step in that journey to doing that. So that's what I wrote the book about, because I know from my own self, the Enneagram really, really helped me understand myself and help me to lead better, help me to be a better son, a better father, better husband. It helped me to do all of that because now I have the tools to be able to operate with that. And then now as a leader, you know, when I, when I teach it at the school for the, for the faculty, now we don't take it personal. We're not taking this stuff personal like we used to. And the parents are not taking it personal. Because it's funny when parents start understanding that the, the teacher's personality and the teachers are starting to understand the parents' personality, then they kind of get it. Because it's hard when you're doing, we teach, we go up to the eighth grade. It's hard teaching with people, the, the kids are great, but it's the parents that can drive you crazy. So we need tools. And remember, if you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So this is just another tool in the toolbox to help us understand ourselves. And I just want to emphasize what you said earlier about purpose. And when we have our purpose and we are driving in the same direction as our purpose is calling us to go, we're not going to get run over. Right. And I just think those are such powerful words to take just one of the many takeaways from this podcast today for our listeners. Right. And you know what, Dr. Amy, to drill down a little bit further in that is it's just like staying in your lane. And when you when you think about during the Olympics, when people are running in a relay race or running in a race, they're not looking at what other people are doing. They're looking ahead. People fall when you're looking at what other people are doing. That's when you trip and fall. But as long as you stay focused in what's ahead, you can run the race. And what I'm just saying is the Enneagram helps me stay focused in my purpose so that I'm not looking over here and looking over there and seeing what you're doing and seeing what that person is doing. And then I trip and fall. That making sense? Absolutely. Thank you so much. This has been so inspiring, not just insightful, but inspiring. And I really, I'm, I know our listeners will get a lot out of this and don't be surprised if people start contacting you say, can you, can you look at our Enneagram too? Oh, yeah. I do it all. I do it all the time. Yeah. Is, is, is this another way of ministry? Is this ministry for you? It really is. It really is. I, I really find it exciting to help people understand themselves. And remember, I didn't, I only talked to you guys one time. So everything I shared with you, 
I mean, it wasn't something that I, I it's scripted. It wasn't magic, right? <laughs> exactly. You get what I'm saying? And so imagine what this is like when I do coaching or when I'm doing counseling, when I'm helping couples understand themselves. My young adults from the church, they love this because they're dating. <laughs> the students, when I go to the different colleges, for their like helping them with freshman week or you know helping them with the fresh the freshmen love it because guess what they're dating so now they've got tools to understand their relationships and they have tools to understand themselves and their their roommates and their people in their dorm and people in their classroom and their professors they have so they enjoy me teaching that enneagram to them because I make it fun Wow, I've had fun. So I'm really glad that we were able to talk to you today. And thank you. Thank you for being thank with you us. Thank you very much. It's really been so incredible. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And I'm uh, anytime you want to talk about the Enneagram, you know, I love to talk about it. So just let me know. Thank you for listening to Teaching and Leading with Dr. Amy and Dr. Joy. Visit our website at govst.edu slash teaching and leading podcast to see the show notes from this episode. We appreciate Governor State University's work behind the scenes to make publishing possible. Stay tuned for more episodes with Dr. Amy and Dr. Joy.